Not so far. I'm Bob Muller. I'm the uh, president of the board of directors. And we're here tonight, not for a board meeting, but rather an informational meeting called town hall meetings. And the subject tonight is the rebid of our management agent contract. Um, before I introduce George Spaltoff, just a little history. Our contract runs through December, December, December 31st of this year. So we saw a need in, in 2018, in April of 2018, we commissioned a uh, task force to look at how we go about doing a rebid of this contract, rather than just saying, oh, we're just going to give it to the incumbent. And we felt that it was our fiduciary responsibility to do that so that we got, made sure that we were getting the best value for our buck. So George Spaltoff stepped up and volunteered to lead the task force, and I was all too happy that he stepped up and all too happy that we gave him that responsibility because he's done a magnificent job. So that was starting in April of 2018, and he'll tell you about the process, the people that are on his team. It's more than just George, but let me tell you that he's going to talk about it. The amount of effort and time that those volunteers, volunteers spent is amazing. I mean, we couldn't have afforded it if we hadn't paid for it outside. So with that, George Paul. <coughs> First of all, I want to acknowledge that I'm really pleased to be here representing a team effort. This didn't happen by me or just a couple of people. Um, we had everybody representing every standing committee, every one, and three board members. And even though we lapsed over years, we had continuity. This was truly a team effort. You're going to hear about the first question, it worked. Uh, why did we why did we rebid? Ford's County has never had any vendor other than RCS. There are many companies who it was believed offer many different diverse methodologies. We did not know all about that. We did not know what was familiar, what could be done. Ford's County is spending over six million dollars this year and the coming years it will go up a little bit surely to support the activities to maintain the community and to keep us the premier communities that we enhance and keep our own values. It's been over ten years since we actually heard from another company about what they can offer. That's a long time. In IT that's centuries. Yes. Yeah. So we started actually meeting as a committee in May of 2018. So this is what you're going to see tonight is basically the culmination of 13 months of work. And the rebid process. I'm not going to read to you. There are a lot of words on some of these slides. The reason it has a lot of words is this presentation is going to be posted. If I only put one or two words on a topic, anybody reading it would not understand the process or the message. So there's a lot of words. We're going to go and talk about the rebate team. A quick look what has occurred in 13 months. What the task force wanted. Very important, what the task force wanted. The RFQ, the RFP, what the vendor said, the evaluation process, the results, the recommendation, which is probably why you're all sitting here, but you might have to wait a few minutes. <laughs> the next steps, then final comments, and at the end, I will take any and all of your questions. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, like I said. Now. I'm going to ask any of the team members who had any input or served on the team as a regular to please stand up if you're in the audience. <laughs> These folks went home from just about every meeting that we had with homework. I'm serious, serious 
homework, writing, evaluating, working with their committees, and a very difficult thing because the people, the person could not tell the committee exactly what they were doing, but the committee was being asked for information. Kind of difficult at times, but that's because every one of these people and a number more that aren't here this evening had to write a statement of work. What their committee wanted done. What they wanted a commitment for of work to be done. So, that's the agenda. Here's the names of the rebid team. That's page one. <laughs> Many of you are here, but I just want everybody to understand this was a big team effort. Board members, Myself, Sally Frazier, and Ray Van Cott. Ray replaced Don <coughs> Holler, and I chaired this group. And there were alternates, because we asked that if a person could not attend the meeting, that they send an alternate. So you see the list of alternates. So a quick look at what has occurred. Twelve companies were solicited. Three companies submitted proposals. Two of the largest nationwide providers of MA services. The proposals were extensive, different, and educated to the test. <coughs> to date, 1,390 hours have been expended by the test. That's a lot of work. <coughs> there was discussion regarding the purchase of RCS and retaining current management and staff as a solution to the RFP. The companies that were talking about this would have added profit margins to those options. Let you mull that over for a minute. So what we would pay one way, they just put 10 or 15 or 20 percent on top of it. Didn't seem to make too much sense. There's 20 something items that came from a brainstorming session. What we wanted to see in a new contract. Very important because this would become the guide for what we were looking for going forward. First, an entity that the membership would be comfortable with. Institutional knowledge of Fourth County and James City County, and I will tell you the three bidders all met that requirement. Responsive, efficient, proactive managers. On site and positive interactions. On site is a big deal. Not everybody does everything on site. Some have a couple people on site and do it in a back office scenario. Able to build good relationships with committees. This is a committee focused community. We bring things up for improvements, for amenities via committees. We manage our things with committee recommendations. <laughs> I focus on membership relations. We want the membership to like living here. And I think we're pretty successful. If you look at the recent surveys and all, we're pretty good with that. And able to establish long tenure and knowledge in the current job. I don't want a turnover of the major portion of our workforce every year because you lose with the training problem. Working knowledge of HOA insurance and HOA company type insurance, it's different. Knowledge of governments and enforcement methods, able to support the talk of the colony. That's an award-winning magazine. That's one of the best pieces of PR we have. Digital communications, we've got to go forward in the digital era. Competency, competency and budget, budget formation. That's a task every fall that involves all the committees and all the people. It's coordinated by the managing agent. Voting software. We vote online. We don't need somebody, if you will, trying to break into the voting system. We need it run right. We want the people to be able to develop personal relationships, become a part of it. 
strong understanding of security. Our security does more than 99% of the security functions in every community that exists. Most communities, if you have somebody on the floor because they fell out of a wheelchair, you don't call their security, you call 911. In our case, you probably do both, but our security people will be there first. Strong support for the ARC rules and regulations. Support for annual HOA goals. Understanding the use of pass-through labor and material costs. Pass-through doesn't mean, oh yeah, whenever you pass through, I'm just going to add 25% to it. That's not what we mean. Support for innovation and upgrades to process and IT. Strong professional qualifications and credentials. More than the minimum is what we were looking for. Strong board support for special meetings, town halls, etc. And lastly, support for data security and record treatment. That came out of a brainstorming session. You will see in some of those items there are specifics that a particular committee was looking for. But that's what we wanted. So we used those things when we, con when we wrote an RFQ and an RFP and when we evaluated them. These were the items we were looking for. These were the issues. So, the RFQ process, we only had 18 more. By the way, editing a document with 18 authors is really fun. <laughs> the document was distributed late last fall to 12 companies with a request to acknowledge receipt within seven days and notice the committee of intent to submit a proposal. 11 companies responded, four stated they desired to submit proposals. The Rebid Task Force then work, went to work writing an RFP. The purpose of the RFQ was to narrow down the field as to who was really interested in Fort Trump. We did that. We accomplished that without a problem. Each standing committee authored a section describing the required deliverables their committee desired in the next contract. That's a statement of work. Board members wrote sections regarding general services, Front office services and the proposal guidelines. The document was edited and sent to the four companies who said they would bid for the contract. And we included a number of addendums containing budget, organization, and backup files for the ARC, RPM, security, and strategic plan. The document itself was about 60 pages, and the addendums were about 260. If the companies did their homework, almost any question they had was in that paperwork. The offer for a property tour was extended to each of the companies. Two of the companies came forward, and I gave them personally about a two-hour tour from a scripted, rooted tour that nobody saw or got any information that anybody else didn't get. We were trying really hard to make sure fair and level playing ground that everybody was on. So the bidders also provide, were also provided the opportunity to ask questions. I got 18 questions. They were all four companies <coughs> got their responses by April 15th, this past April. There's the names of the four companies. Social Community Group, Camp, First Service Residential, and Real Tech. They're in alphabetical order. Uh, the first and the third are very, very big. Very big. So three proposals were received. Camp bowed out of the bidding process the day before proposals were due, citing the lack of personnel to meet the requirements and that they were already stressed to meet their current contract needs. I thought they should have known that before the day before, but that yeah, was just me. So proposal evaluations. We developed a spreadsheet matrix that included every requirement and every metric request in the entire RFP. 
we then had everybody go through their sections and score from one to five each of the items. They then, we then put all of those scores together and came out with a net score for that particular company. Our capital reserve model is big. This is close to that same one that's on. Although not quite as involved, it's, it was one way that we took out individual bias and individual ideas of I like this and I don't like that because we had so many people scoring the same way. Committee members were the primary evaluators of responses to their committee's requirements. It just made sense. They know what they wrote. They knew what they wanted. They should be the ones who gave the primary ratings. The team then met to discuss the RFP evaluations. From that, there were questions that surfaced about specific proposals. Words like, they weren't responsive. They didn't answer the question. They didn't tell us what we wanted to hear, good or bad. They didn't tell us anything in some cases. It was an interesting session. Interviews. Now, we bring each of the three companies back here, here, physically here, for interviews. They were given 20 minutes to present more information. It could be a sales pitch, it could be clarifications, it could be just about anything. We asked them between 22 and 24 questions each. Some of the questions were common to all of them, and some of them were specific to them. The task force met after each interview by solving a couple of the members. The overall rating discussion was held in mind. Then there was unanimous agreement with the members of the task force on the ratings. That doesn't sound maybe like a big deal. But I will tell you, if you don't have a story to tell, and you're sitting in front of 16 people, it's pretty obvious that you don't have a story to tell. At that same time, they were invited to submit best and final office, known as a BAFO. And at that time, they could clarify anything that they didn't think was right, and they had an opportunity to modify their costing proposal if they wanted to. Here's an important vendor comment. Unprompted, they came forward and told us, this is the most detailed and comprehensive RFP we have ever responded. That's kind of what we were looking for. We didn't want superficial comments. We were looking for details. I wouldn't say that the company that made that comment had the very best proposal. <laughs> but they recognized that we knew what we wanted. So, 1,390 hours to date, we absolutely wanted the best contract possible to keep Ford's Colony a premier community with the best services, with the best price, in order to maintain our property values. That's kind of what this was all about. So, this is the best value contract recommendation, order recommendation. Task force weighed the evaluations as follows. The RFP process, what we thought of their proposal. The interviews, 30%. Because that was them not having three weeks to figure out what the answer was going to be. That's the way they would answer it if you and I asked them and they had to answer it right on the spot. And the cost analysis. Cost analysis sounds easy, it's not. So, there's a chart coming up which summarizes the evaluations made by the task force for each of the three parts of the process. Let me explain it before you make a judgment. So, there's the three companies. The proposal, I told you, was the result of the matrix. The interview was our sessions following the interviews. The net cost is the one I want to spend a moment explaining. We started with saying if the cost was exactly the same as what we were paying this year, you would get a three. For each variance up, we took points away, and if, well, nobody 
went down. <laughs> right? So there's the weightings, and there's the totals. Associa is a company who gives you a price for individual actions that they do, even though they'd be doing it with people that we'd be paying the payroll for. It's a very unique scenario. For example, every time they send out a covenants letter, they charge you $25, even though the person that I'm paying for on the payroll is doing that. Every time they send out a, oh, you need to fix your mailbox, you need to paint, you need to bring in your garbage can, any, like, any special letters, they charge you every time it's done. So there's an asterisk there because I had to, me personally, put some weight to how many times we do this in a community of 3,000 owners. I want to say it's a swag, but it was a little bit better than that. It was a good guess. Uh, but that makes predicting cost difficult because if you do something 500 times, right? and you're adding tens of thousands of dollars because you're doing it, it gets to be difficult to budget what the number is. Also, the proposal matrix followed pretty much the way the rest of it went. If you look at the numbers, there's a trend. If you don't have something to tell me, when I ask you in person what it is, you still don't have the story to tell me. And that's recognized. So, the task force recommends a contract award to Real Tech Community Services. The task force better understands that Ford's Colony is a unique HOA model. We talked to a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people at convention. This is really a unique support model. The pass-through pricing model is not one that competitors utilize, and they will do it except they won't put a markup on it. The contract cost considerations will cause the least impact to the association budget in the future. The competition, some of them used in nickel and dime costing, the competition recognized the uniqueness of RCS and the Ford's Colony Managing Agent model because they realized they would have a trouble duplicating it, and that's when the conversation came up. Well, we'll just buy RCS and put a mark on it. The task force aware of their thoughts. The personalized service aspects of the current contract provisions were not highlights of competing proposals, but they would tell you that their software would take care of it all. So if you have a street light out there, you didn't have a place to call. You were basically told to go to the website to report it. If you needed somebody to come and unclog a drain, you had a website to report. That's a big difference. We like the idea that you can call up and talk to somebody that's live who's here. So the proposed contract is a six-year base contract, annual cost increase year over year of 2.75%. That's an increase of 0.25% over the current contract. A first-year cost of $435,000. Maximum annual bonus structure of 3%. That's the same as the current contract. New. Two one-year extensions available based on performance. So the contract could be the eight years. And new, a maximum 1% annual contract bonus for cost-saving and sustainable initiatives proposed by RCS and approved by the board. I have heard for 13 months that they have no reason to be cost-effective. People don't whisper in my ear when I have this job. They come up and tell you, they're not efficient. Why would they be efficient? There's no initiative to be efficient. Well, now there is. And that works. We believe it will work. It will probably solve the problem of 
being a, it will take care of it. It's the one percent that it costs us should be covered by whatever the cost savings are. This is an initiative. So yeah, the first time it happens, we pay for it a little bit, but it's going to be sustainable. Why six years at the base? The current capital reserve model audit and review is every five years. And we would have fallen right on the same year. That is a major effort for our volunteers and for our staff. And I'll be honest with you folks, when you think about it, it just isn't fair to try to do those same things in the same year. The annual cost increase is 2.75%. That aligns closely with COLA and the national average for large associations, which I happened to find out when I was to the national conference. You didn't know that. The task force believes that the current MA support model is optimal. We don't see any other opportunity where we as a membership could get the support level that we are currently getting. Subcontracting major pieces of the operation doesn't get you what we have now. And we believe cost savings are, are necessary. We're seeing increases each year, and maybe this could help just a little bit to upset them. <clears throat> the starting number. How was 435,000 number for year one selected into consideration? In negotiations, it was picked up. In 2019, our net number was $419,163. That's been a number that because of the Forts Colony Drive settlement five and a half years ago, has been a number that was calculated. Each year, because of that settlement for the last five, we've been taking, subtracting between seventy-five dollars and $85,000 from the total number of the management agent fee to get to the cost that we have this year. The current contract, the contract we have right now, if you extended it into 2020, would have a cost of $431,737. Maybe you can see where I'm going. So therefore, the delta impact or impact of the new contract is $3,263. Without the Ford County Drive consideration, it would have been $506,000. I can do the quick math to tell you that's a sizable piece of change for every homeowner. That's a good number. So the task force negotiated with the MA to reach a year one. Nobody wants to come down in price. Nobody wants to go up in price. Nobody wants to change their offers. But we negotiated it to 435 dollars I believe the task force and the MA feel this is a good resolution. It supports Ford's Colony continuing to have excellent value per assessment dollar. Go around Williamsburg and see what other communities are paying. Most of them are paying significantly more than we are. Colonial heritage, where the people get a nice clubhouse, is paying $265 a month. Excuse me? Oh. 265 a month, which if you do the fast math is 795 a quarter. A lot of money. What's different in new contracts? Accountability. Agreement on numerous specified tasks. Agreement with the development of measurable metrics. The committees and the MA will sit down and work out metrics. It will provide specific performance measures. I don't expect that there'll be as many metrics as we had in the RFP. But the committees and the MA will work it out so there is a reasonable number and that the metrics will be reasonable. We're not saying you're going to mow the grass every two days. But we can say that we'll keep the grass mowed whenever reasonably possible to a height under six inches. Just, I'm not using that as a metric, but that's the example. Contract items. 
contract term does away with the overlap. Agreement on board approval of RCS successorship issues for the company, for the management, and for department heads. The board retains the right to have a say if RCS wanted to sell the company to somebody else. And that right includes our ability to terminate the contract if it's done without our approval. Contract supports the HOA goal. Each year, we come forward and we want, we want, maybe that's the way I sent you that. We want various things. This contract allows us to continue getting the premier items that we're used to getting. Nothing is taken away and we add some additional items. Next steps. Final contract terms and conditions agreed to with the HOA attorney, RCS, and the board. We will go through the language. Uh, then the board of directors has to approve. That then there's a contract signing. And then we're done. I want to make a note. The importance of this rebid process precluded some information being routinely shared. All the task force members and those with access to the details have previously signed non-disclosure agreements. This presentation, the final contract, the RFP and the RFQ will be posted once the contract is signed. I did not want the team members or myself being swayed or given opinions outside of the realm of our task force. We needed to do what we needed to do, knowing the best that we knew. I've taken some flack for that. I'm sorry, but that's the way this had to be done. We needed to do this in the most unbiased way we could possibly do. That's not easy, but I think we accomplished that. With that all said, questions? I'm going to tell George to come up to the microphones. Oh, yeah. So we have two microphones. Please come up to the microphone if you have a question. I'll be more than happy to try to answer that. Yeah, turn that microphone off. I got it. George, two, working. Two, two questions. Uh, one would be we, we have a really long history with Realtek Community Services. That can't be a secret to any company that we would want to make a bid. Uh, and th therefore, there's to them a propensity for us to give the business to Realtek Community Services. Do you think that in any way affected our ability to get quantity and quality of good bidders and good proposals from them? No, my simple answer is no. The, what is the most defining factor is the size of Ford's column. There are a lot of companies out there, a number of them right here in Williamsburg, who manage via contracts small, small homeowners and small condominium <coughs> communities, 200, 250 units. They do it with a couple of small maintenance contracts. When you get to 3,000, you're in a large-scale HOA. There are a lot of companies, as Camp was very honest in saying, that really stretches their ability to have the staff and to have dedicated staff to, in fact, support the community. We may have wowed them with the RFQ and the RFP. But we were being honest about what we needed, what services we get routinely, and what it is that we expect. I don't think, listening to the other companies, that they were in any way fearful of bidding or anything else. But they're used to. Associate and First Service are used to managing some large communities. Most of the companies around are not. So there's a unique subset of companies who are willing to take on a large, a large community. 
Okay, my other question is, I don't know the number, hypothetically say there's five or ten more or less senior management people mm -hmm. uh, with the managing agent. Do, do we or the board have any say into their selection of people going into senior positions? Yes. Could you uh, talk about that a little bit? Heads, department head, general manager, assistant general manager. Any change in those positions come before the board for, for an okay. For, for an okay. okay. If, if they were to change out any of those folks, it's a board okay. Uh, they, most of those people have uh, some serious credentials. You can't just bring anybody forward to take those spots. So anybody they bring forward would have to have equivalent experience, and uh, we would like to say the same number of years in service, although that's not always possible. But they have to have the credentials, and they have to have experience, and the board has an okay. Certifications. Yeah, credentials and certifications. Anybody else? I got two questions, George. <coughs> about this. Hi. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, vendors that you worked with, did they give you any reference customers that you went out and talked to? They did, and we did. And uh, the folks that they give us reference for, you get the feeling are hand-picked. Uh, I talked to a couple, and some of the team talked to others. And I, I meant customers the size of the fourth column. Yes. Okay. Not always 3,000, but large, right? Because that was the requirement. And uh, we asked questions like, how do they support me? What's your level of satisfaction? And stuff like that. The how you support in just about every case included subcontractors. Some of them have said they see different subcontractors every year. And I can understand that because in a lot of cases they make a habit of bidding out various services every year. Once you have an RFP that can be bid upon like that, they send it out. I'll go back to my favorite, which is like grass cutting. You know how many vendors there are just in Williamsburg who would like to cut the grass. Uh, but having a different vendor every year, I don't think is a good idea either. Because you can't tell me that they walk in here and it's instantly the same quality job that you had for somebody that's been doing it for six months or two years or five years. Next question. Well, let me follow up on that question. So you did talk to, how many did you talk to? Was it five, 10, 20? We had four or five references for each of them. <coughs> okay. And two types of references. And they were all talking. Okay, we'll leave it that one. Second question has to do with best practices. As you mentioned, it's been 10 years since we went out for an RFP. The industry has changed over those 10 years. Did we uncover any best practices that we can now ask the current managing agent, the contract forward here, to implement? Let me explain that a little bit different. The contract that we have with RCS, in a lot of ways, mirrors the employment contract. So we are employing RCS to manage the community to standards that we set. The committee has now gotten smarter as to what is in the industry as far as software programs and all that. We will be going to look at a new financial system, reporting system for the finance committee. It's what we pick. I've already asked, and Tom's sitting back here, the technology committee is going and looking at what software is available for the management of large communities. What financial packages are available? What's in the packages? So we're starting the process. But understand, the agreement basically says that they will work with and utilize whatever packages it is that we determine we want. <coughs> right? I found out, personally, that there's more people want to sell you homeowner management software than I ever imagined existed on the earth. <laughs> they were all at convention. They all have, that. each and every one of them has the best package ever made. No questions asked. They all do everything until you start asking detailed questions. 
And then they do some of that. Well, we link to that. We'll do some of that. Here we do this, we do that. But they all want your business. And the big question is transition. Because it all involves databases. And, well, how much do you charge for transition? Well, I can't give you a number right off the top, mm -hmm. but how many records do you have? <laughs> 3,000 minimum? Oh, that's big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you like I heard it. <laughs> they, we have a good idea of what's out there. And we've already started the process of looking into seeing what, we, what makes sense for Good, terrific. Thank right? you. Anybody else? Wow. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for being here. I really thank you for passing on to your clubs, your neighbors, your one and nines, what the message is and what that message is very factual. We did our homework. We've come to a decision. I think we came to the right one. So thank Congratulations. You. Before I uh, open the floor to questions that are other than the MA rebid, if there are any, um, I'd just like to point out that there was one slight missing thing is on the 27th or maybe earlier, because George can't be here on the 27th, we have a board meeting, and the board needs to hear the recommendation and formally accept or reject that recommendation, and then that will start the whole process that you heard about with the final culminating in the board approving the new contract, signing the contract. So that'll, that's a little wrinkle that we have in there. Um, on behalf of myself and my board colleagues, I want to thank George and all of uh, the people that spent the 1,368 hours plus. Uh, they did a fantastic job and I think we're going to be a better community having gone through this. So with that, Please, if there are any other questions that you want to talk about or whatever, we're more than happy. Please. What is going on at Westport? I know it was defeated by the Board of Supervisors or whoever voted. Oh, uh, two, uh, two different things. Let me, let me, can I go through both of them? Because Westport is actually two different pieces. The first piece you're probably talking about is what we call the park, which is Eagle Construction, which is 81 units that were, I call it, the, kind of the front when you came in on the right, they proposed to change the density of the zoning from A1, which is uh, one unit for, you know, an acre, three, three, three acres, one unit for three acres, to R4, which is what we had in Forge Colony, which is less, it's, uh, you know, it's more dense, it's less things. So they wanted to do that, plus with an R4 zoning, they are able to have gated areas, which you can't with A, it's the county has to own the roads, which is what they're gonna do at Westport. So that was the one that the Board of Supervisors turned down and it was basically, uh, this is me talking, it was because of the traffic impact, they were, they were uncomfortable with the traffic, the potential traffic impact. Uh, Eagles had not done what's called a traffic study and uh, had they done that, it would have cost them a lot of money, but I think they would have found that the traffic impact wasn't there. But that being said, it was denied because of that. Eagle uh, appealed the denial. They wanted to rear, I don't know if it's a rehearing or they just appealed it. And that was uh, settled in court, and the court found for the James City County supervisors, so they didn't overturn it. To this date, we don't know what's happening. Uh, Eagle's still out there. You know, are they going to go and change what they had from 80 units to some other number, or what are they going to do? We don't know. The other piece that I want to talk about, they do. That acreage, I don't know, Drew, how, how many acres is that? 45. 45 acres. So. The other piece is about 160 acres, what we call Westport B, which is kind of on the other side of Westport A, which if you go over today, you know, that's where they're building the houses. And Westport B, was actually purchased by the James River Baptist Church. And we are working with the James River Baptist Church. Uh, we've told them that you work with our lawyer, you pay for our lawyer's time, and you come up with a thing because they want to be separated from the HOA. Because the 
supplemental agreement that we, that's in place has them as part of the HOA. And be truthful, the board is not wild about having a church as, you know, as part of it, because do all 300 and 500 members or what get to use our facilities if they're HOA members, even though they pay one assessment maybe? So we're, we're supportive of that, but we don't want to pay anything to figure out how to do that. And so we've got the lawyers working on that together to figure that out. And uh, when they do, we'll bring it back and tell everybody. But our, our desire is they, they want to basically <coughs> potentially have a very minimal amount of acreage that might be residential. I mean like 10 acres out of 160 or something. So that maybe they could be part of the HOA or, or not. But for the most part, they want to have campsites, they want to have bigger church, they want parking, they want, you know, that kind of stuff. So, in my mind, that's just not compatible with what we use for a residential. Yes, sir. You want to come up or go pass the mic down? And, and the reason we're doing this is we are videoing it. Uh, you'll be movie stars, no doubt, on YouTube. <laughs> And, but we, we can at least capture the question on the microphone. It's, it's more of a technical question. I don't know if George is a better person or not, but a couple things you mentioned. We're a large community. We are. And I remember going back, I mean, eight, ten years ago, we had multiple databases, and we always talked about combining them. There's a cost associated with having different databases. Mm -hmm. I've never heard any reduction of those number of databases, other than just, we just have the one that we principally use, but you still need the other ones for other functions. I'm wondering if have any improvements that we can talk about with respect to that. And then the second part of the question, which is more also cost related, I just want to come out with it, is we're a large community. We have services that each one of us pay. The one that bothers me the most is communications, because we have limited choices. Cox is one of them. <laughs> Cox is the only one, isn't it? <laughs> and it's not the only one. It's not the only one. Technology has changed considerably since I was involved in the technology committee years ago. And I think we even have a tower on our property. And with the advent of G5, which is the wireless type of thing, there are realizable alternatives that we start working on. It. And if we do it as a community rather than as an individual, when I dealt with Cox, who was trying to get them to do over things, to, do, to lower the price and do better things for us as a community, and they said, hey, we already got 70% of you, and this was like eight years ago. Why would I want to lower your price? Okay, that's the mentality. I think we can look at other alternatives if we as a community provide them. I've never seen a committee or anybody or a board in general want to take on some of that overall responsibility. And the managing agent, you can look at the courts. Like, we, we have direct links to every one of our guardhouses. And they, we don't need that. Not if we can somehow put it out ourselves. Yeah, and I know technology is working on it, but no. to what extent is the board going to consider that or put it on their list of 1,390 hours or whatever number of hours that you have to start <laughs> saving we, some of the money for everybody and we, we technology made, oriented. Yeah, we, we made, we made pleas to providers a la Verizon who has Fios. Truthfully, Verizon's not interested in putting fiber in the ground. No, that's, not, that's not you know, so, but the 5G is something we keep hearing about and it's going to be wonderful. Where is it? I don't know that they rolled it out yet. I'm not a technology. It's not, it's not in Williamsburg. So five cities. Pardon me? It's in five cities. Five cities. Five, cities. five metro areas. Yeah. And so that it's coming. So is Christmas. I mean, you know. So yes, we are aware of that. Uh, technology is taking it aboard. Tom Plotwinski back there is our chairman of this technology, and I'm sure he'd love to have. People that are in the business, if you will, join them and help them with that. Uh, we certainly will take it on, and we'll take it on as a community to uh, present that because we think that's one that I think the community can get behind. It's apolitical. It's not, you know, support this school, that school. It's it's apolitical. It's something that's going to help everybody, and we'll get on board with that. But that's what I heard was, you know, everybody said, "Oh, solutions 5G," because we, and I think. The cell tower you talked about is not actually, is it on our property? I think it's close, but it's not on our property. I was told that at one time in the area of Westport, I think it was, 
or Westbury Park, we wanted to go out in the swamp area or whatever you want to call it, and put one, and they actually put some balloons up. I said, how does everybody like this? And they went, oh my God, you can't have something that tall. You know, we don't want that. So, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have a cell tower here. And of course, people build cell towers to rent them to the people that use cell towers. So if you don't have a user, you know, why are you gonna build it? As far as the database question, Here you go. we actively have two. Two. With regard to databases, uh, we have two. Basically, TOPS, which is one that we're considering an upgrade for, and Dwelling Live. Dwelling Live is the new one. I can tell you from asking the question, very few of the integrated software solutions for communities do anything more than connect to a dwelling live or one of its competitors. They're very unique software. They do very unique things. And they don't, have not built that software, that capability, into an integrated software system that I was able to find out about. So we're maintaining two. That's not terrible at the moment. Three would be made. Well, that's a tool. That's not really. A but there's a there's a database there. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. call that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions? There being none. Hey, well, I I have. Uh, You're not allowed to speak. <laughs> I just got a phone call. I know it's ending, so I'll throw this in. I just got a call from Forest College Security. I'm no kidding. I went out to get the phone call, and they said, your top is down, and it's raining. Now, why would you leave your top down? Well, it, <laughs> thank you, and the serious part of this, I listened to those other bidders, and no other bidder would have that kind of personal security available. <laughs> and, and that's not an advertisement. And, and I want everyone to know, he needs it. He needs it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't his top? His top's always down, yeah. <laughs> okay, unless there's other serious questions. I want to adjourn everybody. Once again, thank you very much. And the board will be here.